Welcome to the Legion Strength and Conditioning Podcast. You can check us out at legionsc.com or follow us on Instagram at legion.sc. So after an injury, getting back into training, athletes are often in a gray area between being injured and being healthy. And that this is a pretty tricky spot for people to navigate both as athletes and as coaches. And so before we even start talking about this, I do think it's important to give some sort of uh, disclaimer, right? That we're not physical therapists. Um, people shouldn't disregard the information from their physical therapist to do something they heard on a podcast. You know, people should speak to doctors, physical therapists, licensed medical professionals about pain and painful issues. And that that's more important than again, just the, the ramblings of a few blokes. Is that the right word, Luke, uh, on, on, on a podcast, but all that said, um, you know, there, there, there is this interesting in between area where, especially in a sport like CrossFit, you know, someone starts to get some nagging shoulder pain. Someone's back gets a little bit irritated if they do too many heavy squat cleans, um, a little bit of knee pain from too many double unders. And maybe this is an, an injury that's enough that someone does start to receive treatment for it. And then they're potentially cleared from treatment. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, you're good. You can start doing squatting again. You can start doing double unders again, go for pistols, whatever. Um, but then when someone just jumps back into to their training that they were doing before, they re-aggravate the situation, right? It's like, okay, my knees kind of bother me. I took some time off. I went to physical therapy. They stuck some needles in my glutes, gave me some exercises to do, cleared me to go back to activity. I jumped back in. I did 500 double unders and 150 pistols and my knees hurt again. Uh, what do I do? So this is this is tricky, right? So we need, we need to figure out how to navigate this in-between area where someone isn't necessarily hurt in a way that precludes them from doing activity altogether but if they do too much, they'll re-aggravate the exact same problem that they had previously. And I think for today, we'll probably talk more about these kind of chronic overuse injuries, these, these irritations that kind of emerge over time rather than an acute situation of like, oh, you know, I was doing a box jump and all of a sudden uh, someone knocked the box over and I landed on it sideways and my knee twisted around backwards. You know, that, that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about my elbow started to hurt gradually over time until it became an actual problem. So Luke, what do you think about this? What do you think about this gray area where someone's getting back into training, they're healthy, but they're maybe not fully prepared to resume activity? Yeah, so I think the 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 very common situation that occurs within CrossFit just due to the nature of high repetitive movements and especially in, in certain patterns um, is that they do get these overuse injuries and it is quite difficult to navigate because there's, there's obviously... Um, the desire to do, you, you know, play your sport, actually, you know, perform as you were previously. Um, there's this desire to get better and improve. Um, but then obviously there's this sort of need to rest and also be very, very sort of tactical in how you reintroduce movements. Um, and I think that quite often a lot of people feel the need to either that they have to practice these movements or they have to do these things because they may lose them or that they need to stay on top of it for competitive purposes. Um, say for instance, they're a couple of months out from the open and they, they, they feel that they still need to keep a, you know, they, they haven't a shoulder issue, but they still need to keep a high volume of kipping movements. Um, you know, kipping gymnastics movements, uh, to basically be a, basically to be able to withstand you know repeat exposures of workouts um, that potentially come up and these are all definitely valid concerns but I think that the main point is that people need to realize that if they don't go through this process um, carefully then they essentially can prolong the whole thing and then they can cause things to be very chronic and there's definitely certain things i mean i've definitely ex experienced and still experiencing and this is you know maybe after a year and a half off of doing sort of crossfit i'm still experiencing certain lingering things like golfer's elbow uh you know inflammation in my shoulders when i go overhead too much or if i grip too much and these are all things that have stemmed from crossfit um so you have to be really really careful in how you reintroduce movements and also how uh, you go about just sort of practicing these patterns because there's so many uh, moving parts within CrossFit that quite often what ends up happening is you may rest your overhead movements through, you know, hanging 
variations, but you're still going overhead through pressing variations, right? You get a bit of a shoulder pain when you're going through, you know, kipping toes the bar and chest the bar, but when you're actually going shoulder to overhead or if you're doing overhead squats or dumbbell snatches and these types of movements, then you, you know, you're not actually feeling anything. And I think that obviously that means that you, you shouldn't necessarily stop doing those activities that uh, may have some crossover but I do think that you need to be very careful in how you do that because really quite often when one thing is taken away from someone's training, um, sometimes another thing can be added. So it's sort of almost like, okay, well, I can't do this, so I should be able to do this. And, you know, generally speaking, people who compete within competitive CrossFit, they like to work. It's not it's not something that, you know, as coaches that we often have to tell people to calm down, to, to, to sort of... Um, to, to work harder, right? We are usually telling people to slow down. Um, sorry, I got confused there, but <laughs> you get, yeah, I, I think everyone understands that point. Um, but essentially, is is trying to make sure that people um, will understand first of off, you know, what is causing pain, what is causing discomfort, what is actually going on. Um, are you actually getting, you know, hopefully that they are getting advice from someone who's a physical therapist, someone that they trust, someone that they've they've uh, they've developed a, a good relationship with. You know, I see a lot of people seeing loads of different physical therapists and loads, of, and, and sometimes that that can be quite um, counterproductive. You know, although everyone may have a valid point, I think that especially if you are someone who is competing at a high level and you're getting body worked on on a regular basis, just as your coach develops this sort of understanding of you as an athlete, your physical therapist and the people that you work with in that capacity, they're going to develop an understanding of you there. I mean, that's a little bit off topic, but I think that it's very important that people um, look at this a little bit more from the idea of, okay, I need to um, I, I need to be able to have a strategy in place which is going to allow me to you know, return to play as quick as possible um, but make sure also not rushing that process. Uh, but then as well as that, when I am in that position, what do I need to do to prevent that? And having someone who can help you through that process is, is really important. It's not just a case of going through 20 minute yoga uh, flow mobility type things and that's going to fix everything. It's, it's actually, you know, really trying to sort of get down to the issue. Um, you know, it could be that you have weakness in a certain area, but, you know, quite often within CrossFit, it's like I said, people like to do work. It's like, oh, I have a weakness there. That means I need to do more work there. And then what ends up happening is they cause essentially another overuse injury quite often. Um, you know, you sort of hear that with like, you know, people talking about, you know, weak posterior chains being, you know, the the sort of the weakness of everything and and the re you know if you've got a strong posterior chain then you know you can you can you can do everything and everything you want in your your athletic life but you know reality is is that you don't necessarily want to just overload that because the amount of work that you do within crossfit um that is you know in that hinging pattern is that, that there's quite a lot of stuff that going on there um but i think having a clear plan for sort of you know return to play but also being flexible within that and not trying to rush the process is really really important and just being a little bit more stoic in your attitude and a little bit more understanding that this is something that needs to be uh, approached over the uh, over a long period of time um, i think that's really important yeah, Luke, you started to touch on a few kind of practical takeaways there that I think are pretty important. And I think throughout this conversation, we should probably, you know, as usual, of course, give people a blend of some pretty practical stuff, as well as some potentially more theoretical ways to think about solving these kinds of issues. So one of the things that you started to mention was just this idea of saying, okay, if you can't do this, well, maybe you can do that instead. You know, and I think a few things come to mind with that, which is, you know, you mentioned maybe some difficulty with shoulder discomfort going overhead. Does that mean you need to stop doing all overhead pressing activity? Or can we potentially modify to doing more horizontal pressing instead? right is, is is you know the inability to do high repetition push press um does that preclude us from doing ring push-ups or dumbbell bench press or something like that instead and is the the transfer and the carryover between those movements 100 percent? absolutely not but we may be able to continue to train certain types of movement patterns in altered ranges of motion you know i mean if we if we stick with the overhead pressing example um 
classic example there is, is is a landmine press, right? Which is kind of like an in between overhead and horizontal press. That um, if people aren't familiar with it, the landmine is the the little thing that that um, you can stick a barbell into and you usually stack it in some plates, and it allows you to um, you know do pressing and and pulling activities in a lot of different uh, planes of motion. So in a lot of rehab environments, people will do landmine presses to avoid having to go into full overhead shoulder flexion if that's a, a, an uncomfortable range of motion for them. So I guess I'm curious if you have other examples of ways that you've kind of navigated um, these these challenging return to play, as you said, situations for folks where you modify a painful movement pattern or a movement pattern that people are just prone to developing overuse injuries in to something that's less stressful for them, but still has some carryover to what they're trying to work on. Yeah. So I think that, um, I mean, I have <laughs> lots of examples. Um, I mean, sort of for myself as well. And, and some of the things I've played around with, I probably can speak a little bit uh, more to that, like with say, for instance, uh, knee flexion. So if I've been, going through a period of time where I've, I mean, I've had knee surgery and I've had tendonitis in both knees, you know, and, and I, I'm still sort of, I still have to be careful with how much uh, I do of certain movements. Uh, but, you know, in those scenarios, you know, working with a sled um, can be very, very useful. Going through um, sort of lunging based movements can also be very useful, uh, but sort of trying to like figure out the movement pattern and trying to just sort of figure out what could potentially be used instead of that. Um, I do think that, you know, a big key is just making sure it's fairly controlled. So, you know, the first thing you want to probably do is you could potentially challenge the movement instead of saying like, I am not doing this at all. You could say, okay, well, what happens when you go through that movement in a more of a controlled way? Uh, because within CrossFit, you're going through a lot of dynamic work, whether it's, you know, touch and go barbell work, whether it's jumping in and out of a squat when you're going through your Olympic lifting or whether it's um, going through kipping movements. So you have essentially the body moving into, you know, deep ranges, loaded, but also doing so fast and repetitively. And say for for example, um, within weightlifting, right? You have obviously uh, the the same movements that are applied there, but sometimes you you you, don't, you I mean within CrossFit you have say for instance high rep wall balls and this type of stuff, which has you know the potential of creating these over overuse injuries, and that was definitely the case with me. So it's sort of figuring out the movements which um, were causing that stress. Uh, taking them out, seeing what you could stress the area of the body uh, using that was different, uh, potentially more controlled, and then with time reintegrating things. So when I was looking to sort of reintegrate things, um, and I, you know this is something I do with my athletes, it's pretty much just like looking at the movement more from the lens of like skill and play and just actually just doing it and just focusing on quality movement. So quite often you get people, um, you know, with shoulder injuries, they sort of take a, a step back from kipping movements. So then, okay, how, how do we incorporate that stuff into your training again without it, you know, causing issues? You can, you know, put a clock on for 20 minutes. You could throw in maybe a couple of kipping movements within your active recovery circuits, but you do so in the most controlled way. And it's a similar approach to when someone literally first has, um, you know, a movement. And then bit by bit, you increase the amount of um, sort of chaos and the amount of difficulty within that. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's a real key thing because if you start to sort of skip steps and if you start to go to the point where you are trying to do it within workouts and you're just sort of seeing how it goes at, at that stage, it's, it's very much guessing and you just really don't want to guess in these, in these situations. You want to make sure that you have like a good understanding of what's going on. You've sort of ticked all the boxes off for you to be able to get to that point and then you're going through it and then you, you know, you give yourself some rest after it so that you can understand, okay, yes, maybe this was a little bit too much. So what you do is you sort of take it back a step. You go back to the previous boxes that you ticked and you just stay there for a little longer. 
and then you keep moving through it. Um, I think, you know, the, the, you know, certain, certain elements within training, you know, whether it's skill development, whether it's strength development, all, all these uh, types of things, they can be very much incorporated within rehab, prehab type approaches within CrossFit. It doesn't necessarily have to be standing there with a band or whatever doing, you know, three hours of, uh, prehab work before you go into every single training session like it, it, it can be looking at the movement from just more of a bit of a, like a, a skill perspective and just reincorporating it bit by bit and gradually um you know like i think that it, it's especially if you, an, another way of looking at this is quite often you know now with gym closures and people taking a month off of training at a gym it's like how do you get back into snatching after not touching a barbell and only working with a dumbbell for the last month it's you don't go into it and you expect you yourself to have the same ability that you had previously there's sort of this understanding with that and i think that if people have that same understanding when it comes to injuries that is going to help them a lot more and just sort of under i think just being okay with replacing and subbing movements out it's it's a very common thing that occurs within crossfit you know we um like we do our th sort of like throw down workouts on the saturday where we sort of share workouts and things like that and you know quite often that is a bit of more of a, like a, a chaotic exposure to the programming that, that we give our guys and in those instances we have to make substitutions we have to make ch changes and things like that um you know not only based on ability but also based on uh, you know people's injuries and the things that they got going on and i think that uh, you know one one sort of final point as well is not necessarily just looking at things from like a movement and like musculature standpoint um but also just looking at like the style of movement you know what is it you're actually trying to do is it a high turnover movement is it something that you can knock 20 reps out unbroken of is it something that's a little bit more sort of grindy right so if say for instance strict handstand push-ups are off the cards maybe going through wall walks to about a 45 degree angle and just sort of having a lot of time under tension through that. Um, so you, you'd never really go fully overhead, but you can sort of keep that 45 degree angle similar to the landmine press, but maybe that will be better for you than doing like dumbbell Z presses in the middle of a Metcon, because it's probably going to give you a little bit more of a feel. You have uh, obviously elements of midline stability and things like that that are going in there. Um, but I know that, you know, <laughs> competitive CrossFitters, hate to have to do something as nuanced as a wall walk <laughs> it's just i'm very much like a if i can't count the reps and if i'm not you know smashing through stuff it's like oh, this is this is not part of my training but um i do think that that that's something that's really important uh and and i think that you know just sort of on that note within uh within crossfit i think you know one area of uh, or sort of say one bucket of training the sort of awkward object the carries and that type of stuff i think that can be sometimes really really helpful in just getting people used to doing really hard work under a lot of metabolic demand and you know you can make actual sort of uh, you know you can focus on certain areas um but i think that that's that's a good way of just sort of keeping you know keeping your uh keeping your hat in the sort of shitty shit 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 as Mr. Fitzgerald like, likes to say it's, it's that type of stuff that it keeps you fresh within hard training but it doesn't necessarily uh, have as, as much impact on the body as going through you know the, the high repeti uh, repetition of dynamic movements that exist within CrossFit totally yeah there's a lot of really good stuff in there um, I'll, I'll try to, to crystallize some of that into some fine abstractions and concepts for folks and then we can maybe try to make some of those a little bit more practical again as well so if we're thinking about returning to movements that have in the past caused pain i think some of the stuff that you started to touch on aligns with some of the issues that i've seen from folks trying to return to movement right and, and it seems to be this almost binary conception of whether or not you're injured right it's either I'm injured and I need to rest and do zero stuff until it stops hurting. Okay, I'm healed. Now I will go back to doing exactly what I was doing before. So people can make this mistake where, you know, they have cranky shoulders doing kipping movements. So they do zero kipping movements for six to eight weeks, starts to feel better. Okay, cool. I'm no longer injured. I will now do 150 chest to bar pull ups this week. And my shoulder hurts again. Uh-oh, I'm back to injured. I will do zero kipping movements for 
three weeks. Now I'm healed. I will do 150 chest of our pull-ups. I'm injured again, right? And they just kind of bounce back and forth like this. And that this is just a um, uh, kind of a misconception about how the body responds to pain and how um, you know tissue tolerance plays into either discomfort or the the feeling of discomfort. Let's say so. If we try to abstract some of that stuff out, we can think about both the ability of tissue to tolerate stress, which I think is important for understanding like actual mechanical injury, as well as the brain's processing of negative signals from potentially damaged tissue or undamaged tissue, right? I mean, we could start to go down the the pain science rabbit hole, which I don't know if that's totally appropriate for this discussion, but a lot of the stuff that you're talking about for people returning to play, returning to doing certain types of activities is really trying to ramp up the stress on a specific movement pattern or a specific tissue in a calibrated way, right? Because we start to experience injury when the stress on a tissue exceeds that tissue's capacity to tolerate that stress. So that could be a volume-based situation, right? Where it's like, I'm fine when I run 800 meters in a session, but when I run a mile or more, my hips and knees hurt the next day. It's like, okay, cool. We found your volume tolerance. It's somewhere between 800 meters and one mile. If we want to improve the ability, uh, your ability to run without experiencing pain or discomfort, maybe we don't go from 800 meters to one mile. Maybe we try doing 800 meters in one session and then 800 meters again in a PM session. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. Okay, great. Let's try 1000 meters in one session. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Cool. Well, maybe we try to then increase the running volume over the week and build up from there, right? And, you know, you mentioned some movement variation stuff. Maybe we add more sled pushing as opposed to actual running to kind of get this uh, gate situation loaded more in a different pattern. Can we improve tissue tolerance that way? You know, and there's a lot of variables that you can kind of fiddle with, but if you're just sort of thinking about how can I increase the potential volume that I'm doing without causing pain, that's a very helpful heuristic and very applicable. Again, you know, we talked about different movement patterns where it's like, maybe we can't do this exact movement that, you, that you're that you gonna have to do. Maybe we can't do exactly butterfly chest to bar pull-ups without causing shoulder irritation, but maybe we can do, you know, normal kipping ring pull-ups. That might be something that you can tolerate without pain. All right, let's try to build those up and see if that goes okay for you. Um, and similarly, right, we have this idea of being aware of the volume. We also want to be aware of the intensity. I mean, you mentioned the the dynamic aspect of a lot of crossfit movements where it's like 150 wall balls gives you knee pain. Okay, what if we do tempo air squats? Does that give you knee pain? No. All right. We found somewhere in between, you know, we found the spot where you can do this movement pattern without as much of a dynamic contraction, which may enable you to build up the tissue tolerance to then in the future handle this kind of dynamic contraction. We can think about the actual joint angles that are at play. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, the danger of knees over toes has been overblown dramatically in a lot of personal training literature, et cetera. Um, but the reality is, is that if your knee does drive forward in a squatting motion, that puts more stress on that knee joint. If you have a knee joint that is prone to pain and discomfort, maybe you want to be more careful with how far your knees go over your toes. And you may want to choose movement patterns that enable you to load this kind of knee flexion movement without your knees going so far forward. So we think about how much uh, um, load or volume you can tolerate in squatting. And maybe we say, you know what, maybe we'll try low bar back squatting for a while since you can actually keep a much more vertical shin in that situation. Maybe we'll try box squatting since you can keep a much more vertical shin in that situation. Maybe instead of lunges, we do a, a box step up to a low box that enables you to verticalize the shin before you actually drive up. You know that all of these situations then enable us to potentially load that movement pattern without as much stress on the irritated tissue so we can build up the tolerance of that tissue in order to then handle the stress we need to put on it later, right? So it, it, it's, it's this matter of gradual exposure through either modulating volume, modulating intensity, modulating the amount of dynamism, let's say, to those contractions, modulating the way that that specific joint is loaded. 
And that by constantly tweaking those knobs, we can ideally then increase that tissue's tolerance to stress so that then we can add more volume, intensity, dynamic contraction, et cetera, right? It's not about necessarily resting it fully so that it heals. Like, yes, rest is potentially important, but we need to stress the tissue appropriately relative to its current tolerance such that we can then stress it more in the future. And that those are kind of the knobs that we have available to actually increase that tissue's stress tolerance in the coming weeks and months as we add more training that that's kind of the, the game that we're trying to play i think that you know there's uh what, what i think is really quite useful in that situation Todd, is sort of what you're explaining there is that's where you sort of have to make sure that you are adding a lot of variation into your training and you're sort of looking in other areas of the training world um to sort of figure out strategies and ways to come around this um if say for instance and this is you know something that i see so like quite often is um yeah like the the sort of dialing things back to the point of you know adding 20 reps of a movement every week until you get back to what you were previously doing this is obviously where it can be quite useful to work in that sort of one-on-one -on -one situation with a coach because you can really dive into that and quite often with uh just like general crossfit programs and you know you sort of see this with dot com as well is that what will end up happening is that you sort of just don't really see movements and then all of a sudden you see like 150 reps of something and it's just like okay where did that come from um but you know in the situation of dot com it's like they work they train three on one off it's like an hour hour a day type thing so that the volume of the actual movements you're going to go through it does create a real potent stress for that piece but it's not necessarily something that you're doing week in week out and within crossfit you've got to be careful like within competitive crossfit you've got to be careful because that is something that happens week in week out is and and if you sort of just apply this like random metcon type focus to your training um you know like oh i, I do a heavy workout i do a gymnastics based workout and i do a you know a, 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 like a longer chipper type thing if you just sort of look at it from that very simplistic uh, point of view sometimes you can really just catch yourself off guard and then you end up causing yourself these injuries because you know a couple of uh, just sort of wrong decisions here and there end up causing inflammation to the point where you actually have to take time off um, and just sort of having a bit more of a handle on like the actual volume that you're uh, you know increasing things week to week um, you know it's something that I started to do you know over the last couple of years within um, you know my programming is is just actually like looking at like volume mat landmarks of movements and uh, you know it, I think I remember on a podcast with um, Quinn Hennock who's a as a physical therapist who works a lot with weightlifters you know he was talking about just not increasing any variable of training by more than 10 percent week to week and you know that that's, that's an interesting and quite useful hero, heuristic yeah because Run, runner runners use that as a heuristic as well right yeah. you don't want to increase your your running volume by more yeah. than 10 percent. and there, there's some research on it that can call certain aspects of it into question but just as like a real broad strokes rule of thumb that probably can prevent you know can prevent people from doing something real stupid yeah which is the value in a lot yeah, of things exactly like and, 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 and i think that that's where you've got to it's quite difficult to sort of look at training sometimes especially when it's like okay, unknown and unknowable and random and all this type of thing is like okay it's difficult to actually like take a step back and be like okay i'm going to plan my my training around this and i'm not going to you know because sometimes you sort of see training where people it's like they increase the volume of the reps and the volume of the sets and the the, the weight or you know all in one week it's like no just like one thing at a time 10 percent, just sort of stick with that be patient you know you, you want to be doing this um for a long time and just sort of looking at it from that more you know linear progression uh perspective sometimes it can be quite difficult to people make that to make that shift because they're always just used to doing different stuff all the time. Um, and you know, the sort of sport does require you to be very good at different things. Um, but you also have to make sure that you are in a position where you have a body that can tolerate the more challenging aspects of the sport. And as a sport, it is one of these things where, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a high risk of these types of injuries happening. It's not, you know, it's, it's not say for instance, like a, an impact sport or an extreme sport where, you know, you're going to break your leg or you're going to bust your shoulder or something like that. It's like, these are the types of injuries and issues that, you know, are common, are commonly occurring within CrossFit. It's, 
tendonitis and inflammation and all of these types of things that are just happening um, over just constant use of the same movement patterns, uh, done so in a dynamic way, but sort of taking a step back, trying to look in other places for ideas around movements and how you can approach that. Um, and then, and then just trying to also be adaptable with it as well, because I think that like sometimes what ends up happening is that people will, they, they, you know, a, a lot of people, um, or not a lot of people, there are certain groups and people within the rehab world that try to like very much, uh, you know, make it as simple as possible. And it's like, just do this routine every single day. And all of a sudden you're like, injuries are going to go away or, you know, go, just go through this protocol. And I think that that's quite often because they're trying to sell that to people and people want this sort of super simple answer to a, a, a problem that they have um, and it appeals to sort of our, our way of thinking but you sometimes might have to be like okay I did the McGill, McGill big three and I incorporate maybe you know like uh, I like, like I, I, you know, I'm sort of using certain things that I've done uh, as an example, like, okay, daily cars, McGill, big three, this type of stuff. I've noticed that there's certain things within those, you know, two daily routines that are quite effective for me. So I actually use those um, as opposed to just doing this one thing and expecting it to uh, fix everything and bulletproof me forever. It's, it's probably not going to actually work like that, uh, especially within a, a sport that dictates things are very varied and that you, you're always you know stressing yourself in different ways uh, but you know quite often um, there's a lot of crossover which is you know the big cause of these these issues yeah totally that there's um the I, I love what you're saying just about the the simple solution to a complex problem right that's potentially a good marketing strategy is you know oh you think that your injury works this way will give you a product that conforms to your beliefs that sounds like it's going to actually help you but in reality you know injuries pain training are complex systems that uh by definition resist simple solutions so you know there, there there's a reason that podcasts and products and things that focus on complexity and uncertainty and the reality of how things work don't sell as well as flashy, simple solutions. So, um, unfortunately we're, we're in the, uh, the, the complexity, non flashy arena for the information that we're putting out there. But if someone wants to actually understand what's going on and actually understand how to potentially navigate getting back into training, you know, the reality is, is, is that there's not a simple solution. You have a lot of different knobs that you can turn to kind of rebuild tissue tolerance and improve your ability to train in the future. But it's not as simple as, oh, here's this special warm up routine that's going to magically make your hips stable and control your rib cage and get you out of pain. It's just not going to work that way. So, you know, I, I, I do think that it's difficult to give people super specific takeaways, but Luke, I think you did start to touch on some stuff as well, just about, you know, incorporating things into play sessions, incorporating things into skill sessions. Um, and I know a lot of both athletes and coaches listen to this podcast. So there's an element of autonomy and self-regulation that needs to come into play here, right? That, that I know when I'm writing training programs for athletes trying to get back into doing certain activities that have caused them pain in the past, you know, it's not a matter of me saying, okay, well, you did a hundred squats last, a hundred squats last week. So this week we're going to do 12 squats on the minute for 10 minutes. So we've done 120, right? Like, yes, that's certainly a part of it. We need to be aware of the overall volume, but athletes need to be able to say, I'm going to mess around with this for 15 minutes in a non-intense time scenario, see how it feels, see how I feel the next day and the day after, right? Because it's not always painful in the moment when you do it, especially with, with tendonitis and situations like that, you know, it actually feels better as you're moving. And then over the next day or two, you start to be like, oh yeah, that, my elbow really bothers me after doing all those pull-ups, even though it felt good when I was doing it. So athletes having the capacity to understand how to play with these kinds of things and rebuild their ability to tolerate that kind of training stress on their own with some guidance, I think is very, very important as well. I think one useful way of looking at this, and this is something that can be quite difficult for people in, in competitive CrossFit is, you know, look at the training that a, that an athlete in a, um, 
you know, like a team or a field sport goes through. Like what are the different buckets that they go through? They have strength and conditioning in the gym. All right. There's like literally the like the main goal of their strength and conditioning is so that they just don't get injured and injury prevention. That's like the very first thing. And then it's about improving their performance. They have their real live game scenarios. They have their, you know, team walkthroughs. They have their, you know, video sessions. And, they, you know, there's all these different ways of essentially like allowing them to perform on game day as best as possible. And sometimes the training that you do in the gym or the hours, the time that you spend in the gym, it is difficult to sort of, you know, try to navigate those 15 minutes of just playing around with stuff. But that is your, you know, live walkthrough with the, with, with the team or whatever it is. You're just sort of testing things out and you're just seeing how things go. And, you know, if there's one thing that, you know, you can look to um, the, you know, the, 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 the elite within the sport is that they they have a lot of opportunity because they're training you know three times a day and they just spend their whole <laughs> whole day around oriented around this they have a lot of opportunity to be able to play around and change things up but when your training is sort of 90 minutes a day five days a week and you feel like you have to get everything in um and you have to be progressing everything all the time sometimes that will lead to you aggravating things and prolonging this whole process so taking a step back and just understanding that it it doesn't the 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 90 minutes two hours of training whatever it is that you're going through doesn't always have to be pushing things forward um it can be just sort of taking a step back and just seeing how things are um and and you know doing these like skill pieces or flow pieces or whatever you want to call them yeah, totally. That there's um there's an optimal level of stress that we're always trying to find in training, right? And that's the the amount of stress necessary to either stimulate adaptation or prevent against decay. And depending on the status of a specific movement or recovery from a specific injury, that that stress dose is going to be moved up or down based upon what we're trying to accomplish. And that you know, having that that stress dose be dictated by some conception of what you need to do to remain competitive in a sport is not necessarily helpful. It's where you're at in that exact moment to either prevent you from losing some of the stuff that you've gained in the past or to potentially push you forward to be able to tolerate more in the future. And finding that sweet spot is is really what this um, transition back into training is all about. Luke, I think there's some more stuff we could talk about on this topic with um, some of the the pain science stuff that we didn't really get into, but we could get into some stuff about, you know, rehab um, and movement pattern correction, all that kind of stuff. Um, if people found this useful, I know some folks respond to the emails when we send these things out. If, if, if folks would like to hear more about this topic, um, just email me and we can try to make this maybe a, uh, um, a topic that we continue to touch on. I know we, we haven't really as much in the past, but I do think it's something that we might know enough about to be helpful. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I think it's probably, it's, 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 it can be the most confusing part of, you know, helping athletes out. I think, um, you know, a lot of coaches aren't necessarily, they don't go, through, yeah, they don't go through formal physical therapy, uh, education, things like that. Um, you don't necessarily have to have that formal education to sort of understand these things. And I think that um, there's definitely some sort of things that we can go into. I know that we've had some deeper dives on movement um, and working on that. But I think as well as that, you know, I think uh, just being able to help people um, add something to their toolbox or just being able to like open up um, maybe a, an area for them to look into. I think that could be definitely helpful. Thanks for listening. While you're here, go ahead and head over to your podcast player, subscribe to the show, give it a rating, give it a review, all that good stuff. You can also go ahead and click through the show notes where you can find out more about us at legionsc.com and also follow us on Instagram at legion.sc.